you here with us. Thank you everyone for attending the session. Uh, my name is Zaki, I teach at Pune. I'm also a uh, practicing architect. Uh, uh, my title of my presentation today is Children, uh, Think Children When You Think Building Project. Uh, I will focus on children who, lives on, who live on urban environment and uh, the relationship between building environment and children. As a design professional, I'm interested in the relationship between what we design and the, uh, the people who use that or experience that space or place. Um, it is difficult to incorporate all the health-related related issues of children in a 10-minute, 12-minute slide presentation. So, what I have decided to today is to focus on one important issues of children's health. Uh, which is the children's outdoor activities. The, the outdoor activities that they uh, they get engaged in uh, neighborhood areas. And we all know the importance of, of those children's outdoor activities. Uh, we all, uh, uh, want our children to have it. Who uh, World Health Organization has already, uh, I think they have already mentioned that uh, children above five years of age, they need at least 60 minutes of physical activity per day on average. Um, so that's why I will now focus on that. See whether I have uh, divided or structured my presentation in three parts. In the first part, I will try to explain the current situation of children. Um, we have conducted a study on 100 children living in Dhaka, so we'll focus on that. And the second part, uh, we will discuss the results of our study, and through that, we will try to suggest why we can focus as design professionals. And the third part, I will briefly present an initiative that we took uh, to. Uh, making a space or place for children. Before I start my uh, main presentation, I wanted to uh, start with these type of things. And while I go through the next four or five slides, I want all of you to actually think uh, whether you were able to do this sort of activities during your childhood. <laughs> uh, uh, caught fish, you can't see the fish actually, but that's in the bucket. Uh, look at the smile at his uh, face. This is the children um, uh, having fun with water, climbing trees. Running with your friends in your neighborhood with uh, our friend. If you say yes, you have done this sort of activities in your childhood, then I can assume that you are over 35 years of old. Because it's, uh, because it's very rare to actually, all those bad things are so, it, so it's, it's proven uh, that, that, that there is a relationship. And it's not only true for you know the Western world, it's also becoming, unfortunately, it's also becoming true for our, you know, this side of part of the world. In China, in 1989, there were only 1.5% children who were overweight. These actually I found just day before yesterday. They have uh, presented this result in the U.S. Heart Foundation Association, I think. It's a National Health Foundation funded project. And they have done this huge research all over the world. Uh, I don't remember the exact number of the children, but the, quite a large sample. But they have found that all over the world, children are less fit than their parents when the parents were at their age. They are saying that Nowadays, children are taking 90 seconds longer to reach one point. So that actually shows the physical fitness or the heart condition. So it's, it's there. 
with that background and uh, I'm a design professional and I always wanted to see where I stand in this issue, uh, in this very important issue. So we conducted a study in Dhaka on uh, more than 100 children and this uh, map is actually showing the locations of our children. So what we actually asked, whether there is any relationship between these sort of children's outdoor activities, which we are fond of, which we now understand that important for our development, for our children, whether there is any relationship or what we desire, whether there is any relationship between built environment and children's outdoor activities, or the times that they spend outdoors. This is a very old theory of Kurt Lewin, a famous uh, psychologist, where he proposes that behavior is a function of person and the environment. And it's very true. If you, if you look at the design of this room, the design of this room is already actually influencing us how we will behave. So we can also make an assumption that the design of a city also can influence or have a relationship with the children's behavior. In a very, this was a, in a very uh, simple way, this was our research question. Is there any relationship between children's time span outdoors and neighborhood's physical characteristics? We assumed, and there are literature beyond that, that the more time a chil chil child will spend outdoors, he is more, the probability is high that he will engage in more outdoor activities. So what we have done is actually we have gone to each of these uh, child, uh, child's house and asked them how they use the city, where they go, which places they, which places are their favorite places, which places they hate. And, and uh, we have used uh, the tools that we had, uh, mapping system. We have followed them everywhere and uh, you know children, they, they felt empowered and they had let us know how they actually use the city. We have also, so that was the part of our, uh, one part of our research, we collected information from the children and then what we did is, for each child's residence, we have created a buffer area with the uh, limited GS layers that we have and we have collected information regarding his or her neighborhood. What's the design of that particular area? And at the end, our aim was whether there is any pattern, whether particular type of neighborhood, or whether, whether is there some variable we can identify which actually, which actually can promote children's outdoor activities, which all, all of us scouted for. And we found some very alarming results. Uh, we found that uh, among the, the children that within our study, we found that 33% children spend no time outdoors. And this, of course, this is without the time spent in school. If the school has a playground, then yes, <coughs> she or he spends outdoors time. But we know how many schools have playgrounds at the same time. We found that one in every six children have zero feet independent mobility. He or she actually can't go outdoors on their own. We have also found one in every six children has not a single friend with a neighbor. And this is very uh, uh, common sense, because if you don't go out, you don't make friends. Uh, so this is another, this is another issue. This is a social, social issue, but it's also in So this is a 10 minute presentation. We have actually done uh, some regression. We use some regression model. But I have uh, uh, placed the table over there, but don't go, go through it. I have actually made it very simple. What we, we found some variables or some uh, in, uh, items that we can look into and which are actually related. We found that there's a related with children's time out to how many minutes he or she has spent. So we found these things, total building footprint. By total building footprint, we mean the building density, build from density within that buffer area. We have found uh, the relationship with having a, however small may, may it be, a adjacent space uh, near, near his residence. We have found a relationship between the street type, whether the street is dead end or in front, uh, through a street, so there is a relationship. We have also found relationship with gender and parents' perception of safety. But I'm a design professional, so I will skip gender and parents' perception of safety. 
So we have found these four variables where as an architect, as an urban designer or planner, we can actually, you know, manipulate. So these are the um, uh, items we can look into. Bill form density is an issue. This is, I, I feel bad for a child who lives here. Uh, and we created that as design professionals, so we, we are partly responsible for it. Uh, so it's, it's density, and our study shows that less build form you have, it's good, it's good, but it's not that helpful because uh, we won't be able to have you know a lot of urban open space overnight. It's not going to happen. Of course, we'll try that in the near future, but it's not going to happen tomorrow or within the year. Uh, even uh, the, the, uh, the small parts that we have, we have made some studies to our AMR students. This is a study done by Mahmoud Tajibulosan. Even the small urban parts that we have, it doesn't actually uh, offer variety of activities. But we have found that, uh, in, especially in few residential dead end streets, uh, its uh, children are more encouraged to go out and, and to have this sort of activity where a child is, he feels safe enough to actually uh, paint his money bank on the right on the table. This is actually in other uh, We have asked uh, each children to actually draw the concept of neighborhood. Uh, if you look closely, you see several times the concept of neighborhood has ended in a forest where the automobiles are moving. It, it, this freedom of mobility actually ends there. But we have seen when it uh, become special dead end streets, you can see these sort of activities which we are so fond of and which are actually helpful for uh, our development. And so now, uh, I was supposed to actually, uh, this is the third part, last part of my presentation, I was supposed to present a uh, successful story. This is a story, this is a, ma a master's uh, thesis done by Matlouba Khan, which I supervise. This is not a not an urban situation, but I think we can learn from it how we can actually change the outdoor environment. This is in North Shingdi, it's a primary school, and we wanted a better outdoor environment for children. So we actually went there, uh, just one more minute, we actually went there and uh, talked with the children what type of uh, outdoor environment they like. Yeah, uh, we have designed an outdoor classroom. I don't know why. Uh, and the children got involved. They have helped us. I know people. Uh, I hope nobody will uh, accuse me of child labor. So I will go very fast. And at the end, it was an outdoor classroom, very simple. And we are delighted to see that it has, actually, they have started using it even beyond our imagination. They have used it, uh, they have made functions, they have had classrooms over there, they had a lot of things, which we have actually cultural activities. So it's possible, this is how we use it. So it's possible, and uh, and uh, built build environment has a major role to play. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Raki. <coughs> thank you for the interesting presentation <coughs> and some interesting um, conclusions, but very alarming numbers. Now I would invite Dr. Mahmoud Saki Lakhdar, who is professor at head, head Department of Urban Development, who had. interest in the environmental planning and management of geographical information system, which is what it says there, but I'm afraid that's not very true because I had a conversation with him this morning. He's interested in disaster management, post-disaster reconstructions, right? Post-disaster management. Post-disaster management. That's his basic. Anyway, uh, Shakil, I'll ask you to read. Thank you. You have 13 minutes. Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, first of thing, I think uh, I have to update my web profile from the web because it was very old. I just remember that it was, I think, in 2002. At that time, I was interested in two years. So, uh, I'm not an expert on build environment, unlike Dr. Jati. Uh, 
So I asked one of my colleagues to work with me. Ms. Tarzana has actually worked with this one. So when uh, the symposium authority asked me to prepare a presentation for this symposium, I was thinking, what does it mean being well-being? Does it mean well-being? Does it mean we have a better, if I have the money, I could live a better livable life? What does it mean? So let's look. Just think about it. You are living in Gulshan, Bonani, or Dhanmundi, the so-called post-residency area of Dhaka. I am actually praising the so-called one, intentionally. You have money, house, cars, everything which Bangladesh society couldn't give you. But what would happen if you want to take a 10 minutes distance? It looks like this. We just passed a uh, rainy season, and our rainy season looked like this. And already Dr. Zaki mentioned, I'm reiterating it, our children's playgrounds look like this. This is the parking. Would you call it a better living? I actually went through some literature on what does health and better environment, how does better environment related with health. It's just like an umbrella. Uh, where uh, there is environmental quality, housing quality, and blah, 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 I could go on and on. I am not going on to this. I just said that built environment is related to health, how built environment is related to health. It's kind of related uh, ripple effect. Uh, we then in the things, our urban form actually dictates, as Dr. Bajak already mentioned, that form dictates. The children is perceiving his neighborhood ads where the arterial road starts. And this have is their own impact on our physical fitness, our pollution exp exposure. As uh, mentioned earlier that already uh, ICD will study found that 10% of our children are obsessed. And if I think if I don't, I did not look at, look through that research, but my thinking was that those 10% mostly live in Dhaka City Corporation. Look, look, look at those, uh, look at the gum balls with, who are living in the apartments. They actually have nothing to do. I could, you have, you all have de this experience that you will find your niece, nephew is in his play box, not in the field. I play cricket in the field. I even don't know how to play it in, in play box. So before going further into what we mean, I'm not going to this. As a teacher, I was waiting for theory. So, Mufas, what this built environment is the surrounding, which provides us the civic surroundings of personal places. I think it's better to look at the ground. It consists of everything humanly made. It fulfills the human purpose, mediate overall environment. And this result affects the environmental context. The graph would look like this, but the first diagram it actually shows how uh, World Bank and other donor agencies, or even government, was thinking in different time periods regarding sums. The later one, the, uh, the table actually shows that how much a slum dweller actually pay in different slums of Dhaka per square feet. Now check how much you are paying for your housing. You are living in better quality house. In Mirpur area, this study actually, the other part of the study actually shows how much middle income, so like middle income people pay. In Mirpur, people are paying even middle class societies. People are actually paying from 9 to 10 taka per square feet. They are paying higher, but getting lower quality housing. So is there way a way out? Because I have already told you that I will concentrate only on private sector. There are many innovative work going on all over the world. <coughs> Private sector actually working with local government, community organization, wealthy consumer, even in some cases, low income price rate, which ultimately benefited those low income groups, those people who were living in the slums and shanties of the world. I am going very quickly. So, how private sector claims, if I look at the contract and partnership, is actually working in Metro Manila, in the Philippines. Sorry. This is 
the public private partnership where uh, government is actually giving private sector concession there is all those PPP uh, uh, government agency or some uh, donor agency actually gave money to the community they would contract it with the service uh, providing this group to work on some cases there is between communities and private developer in Guatemala now we are the leader in microfinance of the world but in Guatemala the commercial bank is providing microfinance to the poor people of the Santi people and they are contracting the private owner private community one more one more and some cases in Brazil they actually put negotiate privately in the USA where the I would rather say the where market really works there was cost subsidization for high income consumer what this like that uh, government or local government would give some benefit to the real estate agency if they uh, fix some areas they might get uh, tax relief or some other way they would get in Mumbai Mumbai they are a transferable development right what does transferable development right means this means that you gave a site where some uh, uh, you gave a site to the real estate agency to build then the amount she is allowed it in a place they, he might allow that might, be, allow, might allow that there will be five story housing but if that real estate developer develop a shanty to a better living condition they might be allowed more there is also some land sharing this is th successful case is Thailand in Bangladesh Mexico actually <coughs> NGOs are now giving loan, housing loan, which that could work with the private sector. As I am in time constraints, so I am not going for the uh, transportation, and I'm, they are showing the reference, and thank you. I was very quick. <laughs> more than 13 minutes. Yeah. Still more than 13 minutes. <laughs> Um, our last speaker for today's session is mm -hmm. Professor Nazi Khaled Ashraf, the School of Architecture, the University of Hawaii. He teaches history and theory in architecture, urbanism, and architecture, urban design. Kazi uh, Khaled Ashraf writes on architecture and maintains his elective practice. His research interests include culture of modern architecture, architecture and aesthetism, intersections of architecture and landscape, contemporary Asian architecture, and future of cities in Asia. Apart from that, uh, Kazi Ashraf has also for a long time been involved, he's, 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 uh, demonstrated his interest in Dhaka, on Dhaka. He's, uh, he comes regularly to Bangladesh and he lectures uh, quite frequently and uh, he has, uh, in, in the morning session, he's recently written a book called Design in Dhaka, which is a very good and I recommend people to work with it. Uh, Finally, uh, I'm happy to say that Kazi Khaled Ashraf is a class friend of mine. We went to architecture school together. Khaled. Thank you, Pua. And therefore, I expect that I'll speak more than 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'm still trying to uh, calm down after <laughs> the session in the morning. Uh, <coughs> So perhaps what I'll do here today uh, in this session is actually go back and talk about a few things that I wasn't able to talk uh, that uh, elaborately earlier. Uh, I'm not going to talk about crisis, and I'm not in crisis management also. Uh, there, you know, we show these images and that's enough. And yeah, people have been writing about these things. Uh, you know, you open a newspaper every day, there's something like that. And uh, I started writing about the city, Dhaka City, particularly as a newspaper columnist, <laughs> Daily Star, and later New Age. I'm thinking of like early 90s, uh, when not too many people were writing about like the city, the formation of the city, the practices that are involved in the city. Uh, and I did that. I, I, I wrote about things like that. But I think uh, by another, uh, by the by the late 90s, I decided that I'm not going to write about crisis. Um, anybody can write about crisis. I'm not going to write about crisis. I'm trained as an architect. I'm going to employ my architectural energy in what architects do. They envision. 
and that's uh, and that needs to be taken to the public realm. And that's why the, some of the things that I've done, uh, which is part of the book, is part of that. I've done newspaper uh, uh, media publications on what a possible city can look like. Uh, and I, I find, and I've uh, gotten various kind of responses about that. Now I'll tell a little bit about what kind of city that one can envision about Dhaka. And it's not my vision. I, I would like to think that it's the collective thinking that is coming out through my uh, work. Well, I've been uh, called uh, okay. You're dreaming. Okay, so I'm a dreamer. Uh, it's a utopia, so I'm a utopianist. But none of them be very sort of uh, uh, encouraging for me. And I realized uh, after a while that I will not defend that. I'll say, yes, I'm dreaming. And yes, it's an utopia. Because both are really necessary for turning things around. You know? And utopia is an instrument of critique, critique of what's existing, and therefore then propose what is possible. It's a very old uh, practice, especially in urban thinking. So, uh, what earlier was mentioned by uh, um, by our Dutch visitor, and also I mentioned that the whole crisis of the city in uh, just following industrial revolution in London or Paris or other cities or Manchester, um, it was a crisis. You know, it was not very dissimilar to things like this. You know, we have our own kind of crisis, and some of this we share with what was going on in London some 150 years ago. But that led to a lot of people actually proposing uh, alternative possibilities, which historically we call them utopias. And some of those utopias happening, I say, 1850s, 1860s, in the field of architecture and urban thinking, that became models for actually built housing and built cities. So what I'm saying is that utopia needs to precede planning. Uh, and that has not happened. In Bangladesh, you are encouraged not to think along those lines. It's, you know, it's not in the training, it's not in the thinking process. So that, to me, is a crisis. To me, the first big crisis is, I mentioned that earlier, the crisis of imagination. This is not a crisis. This is something that you have to encounter and handle. The only way to handle that is not by setting up more steering committees and more you know, uh, uh, ministries or sectoral planning. You need uh, imagination, and, and we have to uh, we have to decide whether we have that. But we need to see like what are the things that we need to bring in to the table for that moment of imagination. So I'll go through some of the slides that I mentioned earlier. So this is a summary of some of the things that actually my friend Saiful Haq is right. here. He's an architect, and we have worked together for many years. On, uh, on taking up this uh, uh, ambitious mission, if you like. We have written together in the Daily Star, and some of the things that uh, I did and got together and was published as this book called Designing Taka. So you can, and I will not go through this one by one, but we thought that we need to pr propose a manifesto. You know, manifesto is a very historically loaded term, Karl Marx's book was called the Communist Manifesto, and that made the term very sort of common because you know it means that you need to go out and like change things. Up. <laughs> so uh, people don't use manifestos anymore because they've died because you just can't behave like that. But the term manifesto, the practice of writing manifestos and producing manifestos, ha has historically been a part of architectural practice. I'm talking about Europe and Europe mostly. So this was our manifesto. Uh, and among the various manifestos, some items are very clearly understood. Uh, Mrs. Zaki talked about transportation, housing, uh, open spaces, which leads to uh, open spaces for children, and that's a really an alarming uh, situation that you brought us, brought up to us. So, uh, of all these things, uh, I'm not going to talk about all the items. Just maybe topic number two and topic. Topic number two, really, that Dhaka is an island. What does that mean? Uh, this is an image of old, it's a, kind of an old image of Dhaka. Uh, these are uh, from that book, Designing Dhaka, with some of the uh, kind of, uh, it was really set up as a sort of slogan, and with an image that supports the slogan, that to understand and think about Dhaka, or urban 
thinking in Dhaka, you really can't isolate Dhaka. You have to think of it as part of a larger geographical matrix. And that is Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a delta. And then after thinking this through, I realized that we should not even describe Bangladesh as a geographical matrix. I really wanted to turn it around and really foreground the word hydrology. It's a geographical and hydrological matrix. Because the moment you say geography, it actually highlights land, dry land, land. And for the last 20, 25 years, or even 50 years, planners and architects and people, policy makers, they've always been doing planning via land. Land is foreground, and therefore the technical term is land use. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, in some of the studio design laboratories that I run, I make students that they better not use the term land use. The new term is land water use. Because you don't say that land water use, water is like pushed out over there. Water belongs to, you know, farmers and fishermen and all these people. But, you know, drug, uh, wet creatures. So we have made this division of dry and wet. So what is really fundamental to the geography, if I may use that word again, in Bangladesh, which is wetness, is not part parcel of planning thinking. So how can you plan when the, when the most fundamental aspect of the delta is pushed out of your vision?